Good morning, everyone. I'm Nigel Barmer, Research Director at the Victoria Law Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you to our latest VLF Research Network event. So today we'll be hearing um, about how we might solve the problems of problem-solving courts, and we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Lacey Schaefer of Griffith University. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, wherever you may be joining us from. Here in Fitzroy, I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I'd like to pay my respect to elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians who may be present. A couple of bits of housekeeping. First, only panellists can be seen or heard during the presentation, but please add questions to the Q&A function as things spring to mind. You can also upvote questions from others if you see a good one. We're recording the session today and we'll distribute it afterwards. So if um, you have any colleagues who might be interested, please do pass it on. Before I introduce our speaker today, though, in the interest of transparency, I'm very much not an expert on courts. Um, however, one thing I have written about is how legal problems cluster, cascade and trigger other problems, whether that's civil, family or criminal issues. And it's not just about legal problems, it's about life problems, life circumstances and life events. So legal problems and interactions with the justice system don't just happen on their own. There's causes, there's consequences, there are things that frequently come along at the same time. So my sort of naive take is that a process that acknowledges more than just central legal problem maybe takes the whole picture into account, must be a pretty good idea, right? And surely one that brings a range of complementary services together to address related or causal issues in a more sort of holistic way has got to better reflect need. And that seems like a reasonable aim to me. Um, maybe processes that see and respond to the whole person might even be perceived as more accessible, fairer, or easier to participate in. They might lead to better outcomes. They might even, who knows, reduce the likelihood of reoffending. So me looking in from the outside as someone who flirts with research focused on courts and crime from time to time, um, I'd say my working hypothesis would be that problem solving courts seem like a pretty solid idea. But that's kind of where my naive hypothesizing ends. And as a scientist, I'm going to need to know the extent to which they actually work. So maybe there's no downside. Maybe there are significant challenges. Maybe we just don't know enough yet. As a result, I'd be looking for some research that could give a more comprehensive and more nuanced perspective to enhance my own understanding of problem solving courts. So how they emerge, their prospects, pitfalls, the potential role in the future, and maybe temper my hot take. And that's where I came across Lacey and her colleague, Mary Berriman's excellent paper on the matter, which we'll provide a link to. And we're delighted that Lacey's agreed to come and tell us more at this research network session. So following Lacey's presentation, we'll be joined by my colleague, um, Dr. Hugh McDonald, who does know a lot about courts, um, to join a discussion and ask any of the questions that you put to Lacey. Um, anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Schaefer. So Lacey Schaefer is senior lecturer in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Griffith University and a research member of the Griffith Criminology Institute. She holds a doctorate in criminal justice and also has degrees in psychology and sociology. Uh, she has research expertise in criminological theory and correctional ideologies and interventions. And as a, an applied researcher, she trains community corrections agencies in client supervision strategies and rehabilitation programs. So I'd like to pass over to you, Lacey, and uh, take it away. Thank you kindly for that warm introduction, Nigel. Um, and if I might say, I think you've actually captured um, sort of the summary of my presentation quite well. Um, all right. So um, as Nigel said, today I'd like to talk about problem solving courts, um, focusing specifically on the Australian experience. The title of my presentation is a little bit tongue in cheek, if you will, a bit of a play on words. Um, I don't um, pretend to believe that I'm actually able to solve all of the problems, but what I'd like to do today is really go through um, some of the problems that have emerged in trying to um, sort of uh, propagate problem solving courts across Australia. Before I commence my presentation, I likewise would like to um, acknowledge the um, traditional custodians of the lands upon which all of us are meeting. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. 
I also, um, again, as Nigel mentioned briefly, I wouldn't be able to provide this presentation without the phenomenal research assistance of my colleagues, Ms. Mary Berriman, now Andrews, and Mrs. Caitlin Egan. Um, they have helped to um, sort of gather the available evidence, make phone calls um, and inquiries to all the states and territories across Australia. They've pulled together the available evidence um, looking at the trees so that I could look at the forest and hopefully draw some larger connections about the available evidence for us today. Um, a overview of my presentation. So I'm going to talk about the introduction of problem solving courts in Australia, largely demonstrating how an initially cautious tone has been unfortunately replaced with a little bit of a capricious one, but for good reason. So I'll go through that. I'd then also like to talk about some of the prospects of problem solving courts. There's a number of promising wins, if you will. Um, traditional problems that have been created in the criminal justice system that we've been able to quote unquote solve through these problem solving courts. So that's fantastic. And we're going to talk through um, a few of those. Unfortunately, however, it is sort of like whack-a-mole. As soon as we solve some of these problems, some new ones emerge. So we're going to talk about some of the pitfalls that are associated with these specialty courts. Um, and then finally, I'm going to conclude my presentation by going, look, okay, if these are the things that work and these are the challenges that we're seeing, how do we fill that gap rising up to meet the promise of sort of the spirit of what these courts are intending? to achieve. Now in doing that, a couple of very quick disclaimers. So the first, um, I wanted to make a um, point about language. So um, there are some uh, critics, I would say, that um, say that when we use the term problem solving courts, it sounds very paternalistic. It can actually be quite offensive um, because it's really focused on the deficits that um, offenders might present with when they come before the court. So some people have suggested instead we call these solution focused courts. There's a couple of other phrases that have been thrown around um, in sort of the spirit of um, trying to be consistent with industry vernacular. Today, I'm going to use use um, the phrase problem solving courts, but please, I mean no offense. Um, I'm also going to say that, look, while we've got lots of evidence about problem solving courts in the United States, in the United Kingdom, uh, and abroad, Today, I'm largely going to be focused on the Australian experience. Obviously, we've borrowed some components internationally, but I'm going to focus today on the available evidence of uh, what we're doing here and whether or not it's working in what ways. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned um, just a moment ago, I really am trying to draw on the available evidence base summarily. So I'm making some conclusions and drawing some connections. And I think it's fair that um, for people that are um, well versed in this space, they may go, oh, but what about this one study that says this? I think that's a very fair point. But for today's presentation, I'm going to focus on the 20 other studies that say something different. Unfortunately, today I'm not able to go into a great deal of um, detail about individual studies, instead really talking about sort of the amalgamation of evidence and what it is um, instructive for us to do. Okay, so let's jump in with the introduction of problem solving courts. So what are these courts for people that aren't um, fully familiar? So problem solving courts, um, also sometimes referred to as specialty courts, um, are uh, sort of uh, specialized dockets of defendants that try and target a particular problem. Now, in Australia, what we see is that problem solving courts vary remarkably in their substance, in who it is they're targeting, what it is they're targeting, the methods through which they're trying to target it, and the modes through which the court um, sort of operates. Uh, if we were to say, though, okay, looking at all that variation, what are the similarities? What are those characteristics that help to um, sort of provide that spirit of, of a problem-solving court? Really what we're focused on here, as the name alludes to, we're focusing on the underlying causes of crime, premised on the argument that if you address those things, naturally, reoffending is going to be less likely. In pursuing such an aim, we see sort of a three-prong approach. The first is collaborative case management. So in problem-solving courts, we see that the courtroom work group is expanded. Rather than simply having, you know, prosecutor and defense um, and uh, a non-adversarial judge um, sort of mediating this process. In problem solving courts, we also bring in case managers, social workers, psychologists, treatment providers. 
we're bringing together a number of people that help to um, try and identify the issue that's leading to the offending and intervening in a way that helps it to um, hopefully prevent its reoccurrence. We also see then uh, that we use legal levers in problem solving courts to facilitate treatment. We can um, issue court orders, for instance, that in order to participate in this process and avoid a period of incarceration, for instance, you must adhere to particular requirements, and those are going to include treatment provisions and service referrals, ultimately, again, targeted at trying to um, address why people offend. And then finally, um, problem-solving courts ideally um, and most often contain some element of judicial monitoring. So for instance, the uh, magistrate might say, you know, Mr. Smith, um, I'm ordering you to do A, B, and C, and I'd like to touch base with you again in a month, and your case manager is going to report back to the court, and we're going to decide sort of how you're progressing and how to proceed. Uh, largely, problem-solving courts are premised on principles of therapeutic jurisprudence. Now, what this means is that um, we've got, you know, some evidence that says that traditional criminal justice processes are punishing in and of themselves. So rather than allocating punishment and then the correction system administering that punishment, the process itself can be quite damaging to people. So in therapeutic jurisprudence, such as that embodied in problem solving courts, we're really trying to avoid those harms. Uh, we do this through a non-adversarial and rehabilitation oriented um, sort of uh, uh, constellation of practices that hopefully um, do go on to reduce those harms. Now, the introduction of problem solving courts in um, the Australian context is somewhat comparable to the US and the UK. We've really taken many of the same, you know, spirits, principles, aims, and a couple of the practices um, and translated those to um, the Australian context. However, uh, when we talk about problem solving courts in Australia, it is important to note that there are some uniquely Aussie features, some of them good, some of them that um, sort of raise some questions about how we best want to proceed. Nolan in a 2020, uh, sorry, 2012 piece, um, for instance, describes that American problem solving courts um, feature boldness, enthusiasm, and pragmatism. Uh, Australian courts, historically at least, have really embraced moderation, deliberation, restraint. I think Freiburg in a 2001 quote um, sort of encapsulates this just beautifully. He says, where the United States treads boldly, rapidly, and sometimes foolishly, Australia tiptoes carefully, slowly, and most times reluctantly. Now, as an illustration of this, many problem-solving courts, at least initially when they first emerged, involved pilot tests. So we would do one court in one place and very carefully evaluate its various components before deciding whether the court should continue um, in its current form or be modified in any way, and then whether it should be spread to other places, um, uh, sort of replicating what had been done. Now, we have this initial cautious tone when problem-solving courts were introduced in Australia in the late 1990s. Um, it largely followed the priorities for um, what the Australian Institute of Criminology had highlighted in the early 2000s. Uh, they said that, you know, in terms of crime prevention and what it is we're wanting to accomplish, we want to address four priority areas, uh, drug and alcohol-fueled offending, uh, domestic and family violence, forensic and mental health and its impact on offending, um, and then indigenous justice. Largely speaking, Australian problem solving courts have really addressed these four areas. Occasionally you can find um, some other subpopulations that are being addressed. So recidivist courts, for example, driving courts, sometimes youth courts, but it's really these four that we have seen as um, sort of having a dominant presence. Uh, when we talk about Australian problem solving courts, there is a hallmark that is, I think, both its, um, its beautiful ideal, what makes us special, but also what can be a little bit of an Achilles heel and cause some problems. In the Australian context, what we do is develop native solutions to local problems. Now that sounds beautiful, right? We take a look at the local community and we say, what are the crime problems that are emerging? What's the cohort that's appearing before the court over and over and over? And how do we best want to intervene here? We then take a look at the local resources. How can we maybe address the issue that's coming before the court repeatedly? 
we develop then this sort of tailored customizable solution to that area, to the population, to the resources and so on. Unfortunately, in terms of like measurement, evaluation, consistency, standardization, we see some problems. So for instance, um, when there's fluctuations in government, which um, as a non-Australian, I would say is sort of the Australian national support, uh, support when we have these like leadership spills and so on, a change in government can sometimes mean these rapid fluctuations where the pendulum of, of sort of criminal justice ideology swings in the opposing direction and courts that had previously been operating are sometimes um, discontinued, making it very difficult to try and identify what's really working in this space. So if we've got sort of um, looking at local problems, coming up with uh, local or native solutions, it's really difficult then to identify really what is a problem solving port in Australia. It's quite difficult to take an inventory or to draw some kind of, you know, what are the definitions here? What is a problem solving port and what is not a problem solving port? Now, um, this is more than just semantics because it involves who it is we're targeting, what it is we're targeting, and how we're going to accomplish it. And these things matter for the mission of problem-solving ports. So to illustrate um, some, some brief examples, when we were um, sort of gathering the evidence to um, produce this kind of summary report of, of the context of problem-solving ports in Australia, uh, what does the sort of landscape look like? We tried to contact all the various states and territories, get some kind of a, a tick box exercise of like, do you have this kind of port? If, when, you know, what, how is it operating and so on? And it was literally an impossible task in part because, let me give you some illustrations. We've got variations between and within states and territories. We've then got variation across the different court types and across time. So for example, there's great variation in eligibility criteria. Do defendants have to plead guilty in order to participate in a problem solving court or do we use a um, suspended plea feature? Do we look at the recorded offense type? So we say, all right, you've got a drug possession charge that makes you eligible for this drug and alcohol court or are we assessing a particular um, sort of criminogenic need? For example, a threshold of addiction that we would say you would be suitable for this type of court. We've got chronic offenders that appear before these courts, as well as first time offenders. We look at people that are genuinely motivated, that are actually sort of um, treatment ready and are uh, happy to opt into this versus people that have been leveraged into this kind of process because they are fearful of the threat of incarceration. We also see variations by process. The life cycle of these courts is um, dramatically different from court to court. The entry points, the checkpoints, the exit points. We also see that these courts are shaped by the local agents and agencies. So even the people that are participating in this process, because it is localized, because it is tailored to those kinds of native problems that they're observing, unfortunately, that makes it really tricky for us to figure out what is a problem solving court. I would say that largely in answering this question, these courts are still negotiating their identity. And while that's problematic for people like me as a researcher who's trying to you know, put boundaries around these things, in other ways, it actually provides us with a really beautiful opportunity to um, decide how it is that we wanna proceed. We can rise up to some of these challenges, I think. Now, we see that there are benefits to these kinds of locally flexible, customizable solutions. But unfortunately, that lack of standardization can lead to some inconsistency. So we've seen some scope shift with problem solving courts, for instance. Uh, in some ways, I feel as though many courts across Australia go, well, we're a problem solving court because naturally every defendant that appears before the court, we are trying to solve their problems, right? Well, I would argue maybe not so much, you know, incapacitating someone or trying to deter someone with a harsh punishment, that's not necessarily addressing their underlying needs. A couple of um, examples, uh, just because something is therapeutic jurisprudence, for example, such as restorative justice, again, doesn't mean that we're targeting the reasons why people offend. 
We also see a number of courts that I would say fall under the banner of specialist adjudicators, for example, indigenous courts, where we're looking at really culturally sensitive, um, uh, community informed types of sentencing. But if, is, if it's not rehabilitation oriented, if it's not trying to solve the problem, uh, then in, in many ways we could say ultimately it might not fit sort of the definitional boundaries that we're aiming for. We also see a number of diversion, uh, diversionary operators, such as um, there are a number of drug courts that call themselves problem solving courts, but really all that they're doing is trying to divert, you know, an overflow of offenders from really crowded custodial correctional centers. Simply pushing someone out into the community and saying, oh, attend treatment, if you fail, we'll lock you up, if you succeed, hooray, congratulations without the problem solving element of that case collaboration that's happening within that courtroom work group, I would say we're really just um, focusing then on managerialism and the economics of, of the criminal justice system rather than problem solving. So as a result of this, when we talk about problem solving courts in Australia, the sort of, I think, uh, you know, overarching message here is that we've really blurred the boundaries of what is a court, what isn't a court. Uh, and then we've muddied the meanings of, of what it is we're trying to accomplish here. And this has raised um, a number of problems that we're going to see here momentarily. But first, I want to talk about some of the wins that have accrued. Now, um, some of the prospects of problem solving courts, because we have that initial cautious tone, because many of these courts have been subject to scrutiny, we know a great deal about them actually. We've got a number of evaluations that are government commissioned, which is absolutely fantastic for um, reasons of transparency, um, replication, quite important. We have uh, many forms of evaluation, which is quite rare comparatively, which means we have um, information about a lot of the features of problem solving courts. So for instance, we know much about the outcomes and what's achieved. We have process evaluations to show us, you know, how these courts are sort of operating and the kind of strains and stressors and the things that are smooth and working quite well. Uh, provides a number of learnings for um, people looking to replicate these types of courts and, and uh, you know, limit some of the shortcomings um, observed elsewhere. We've got cost benefit analyses, um, which is absolutely fantastic. And then for me, most importantly, we've been able to conduct um, uh, what are called sometimes black box evaluations. So it's not just does a problem solving court work, yes or no, does it reduce reoffending, yes or no. We also want to know who does it work for, in what conditions, why, how. These types of questions are really important because it enables us to design really effective courts moving forward. So we've got several successes noted. I'm going to focus on three specific categories for us today. So again, a bit of a tongue in cheek talking about the problems that are solved, if you will, by Australian problem solving courts. Um, the first, I think overwhelmingly is participant satisfaction. So this is one of those intermediate measures that I think is quite important. Generally speaking, all the users of these specialty courts, so the perpetrators of the offense, the victims, the staff, uh, the family and friends or the support people of um, uh, the offenders and victims, um, as well as the public, people generally say that they prefer this type of process compared to traditional legal processes. And what it ultimately boils down to, what we see time and time again in all of these evaluations, is that this is really a matter of what we call procedural justice. So rather than being concerned with the outcome alone, you know, did, did the judge, you know, um, uh, hand down a sentence that I'm happy with, setting the outcome aside, uh, participants in problem solving courts say that uh, in, in the way of procedural justice, they felt that the process was fair, they felt that they were seen and heard, that they were treated with respect and neutrality, and these types of um, what we sometimes call soft measures or intermediate outcomes, these are really important. So I, I don't want to belittle these, even if we've got some courts where it's like, er, at the moment, it's not doing great. It's, it's no difference compared to business as usual, or maybe it's actually increasing reoffending. I don't think that means that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are a number of intermediate outcomes related to participant satisfaction that we really need to take to heart that are quite important. Um, and we should be quite proud that we've been able to accomplish that with some of these courts. 
I would also say that collaboration within problem solving courts in Australia are this beautiful example of a whole of government approach. It's rare to see proper case coordination between what's happening in the court and what's happening in the community, bringing together treatment agencies, support services, all together into the courtroom uh, and really having this kind of case formulation discussion of what's going on with this individual, how can we best address it, excellent example of um, collaboration in our criminal justice system, uh, something that I think a number of other elements of the system can learn a lot from. And then finally, effectiveness. Most important in some ways for some people, it's all about that bottom line. We do see that some problem solving courts have a very promising, tentative, but promising impact on reoffending. It's um, largely in regards to particular cohorts, and I can talk about um, some of those nuances later. Largely, though, what we see is for drug and alcohol offenders and particular offender cohorts that have quite complex needs. So that kind of comorbidity approach where we require a number of treatment services at once. Again, because of that case coordination, we can see that um, compared to business as usual, these courts can be quite useful for that particular subpopulation of clients. All right, now in saying that, uh, while we've got many promising features, and I think those three things are absolutely phenomenal wins that we should take to heart and feel really proud of, unfortunately, we've not been immune to challenges. As I said before, when we try and solve one problem, it's like whack-a-mole, sometimes new problems emerge. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about four of them that I observe. So the first is the problem of scope. Again, coming back to this notion of like, what is a problem in need of a criminal justice solution? Now, this really is more than semantics. Uh, this really defines who or what requires intervention and thus the shape of the court. So these kinds of definitional uh, inconsistencies can prove problematic if we don't address them quite thoughtfully. If you define your cohort or the problem you're trying to solve, if you define it too narrowly, you lose your market. There's no infrastructure available to support this, you know, 1% of offenders that are appearing before the court. So you can't restrict that definition too much. At the same time, if your definition is too broad, if you say, I'm going to do all drug offenders and it's going to be a specialty court about drug and alcohol offending, unfortunately, that can also lead to net widening. We can oversupply um, the court with cases that need help. We also have problems maybe meeting the demand of, of being able to service these people. You can over-service low-risk clients. That leads to problems. So there's a number of issues in there. In addition to that, I do think it's important to note that there's a number of legal scholars and sort of social justice advocates that have um, quite reasonably picked up on the tone of some of these courts. Uh, uh, in some ways, the spirit of problem solving courts can show a preference for um, Australian paternalism, whereby we say, you know, government intervention, um, infantilizing defendants, the court comes in and goes, you know, oh, Mr. Smith, I know what your problem is and I'm here to solve it. I bring in everything together that we need to do to treat this issue. And in some ways that kind of tone can be quite offensive, which is why we want to focus on collaboration, clear kind of boundaries around what these cohorts um, are and are not. Uh, we see that in relation to scope, unfortunately problem solving courts sometimes fail to assess eligibility criteria in a more meaningful way. This violates one of the principles of effective correctional intervention known as the risk principle. The risk principle states that the um, sort of intensity of the intervention that's provided should be commensurate with the severity of the problem. So if you've got a first time offender, for instance, you would be over servicing that person by putting them through this type of process. So realistically, we want to be able to measure the types of people that would be most appropriate and best serviced by this type of court process. We also see, unfortunately, um, and sorry, I always hate um, sort of delivering bad news, many problem solving courts fail to assess um, the individual's treatment needs. Again, this violates a number, another principle known as the criminogenic need principle, which simply states that if you want to prevent reoffending, you have to target for intervention those things that cause the person to offend in the first place. If you don't measure it, you have no way of knowing. 
Now, I think that it's a, um, a uh, sort of normal and expected kind of clinical judgment to go, ah, well, this is a forensic and mental health court. And I can see by the police facts, like, obviously, if we treat this person's mental health condition, the reoffending goes away. I think that makes sense on the surface, right? But oftentimes, that's not actually, you know, it's a correlated kind of thing with their offending, but it's not actually the cause of their offending. So to be able to really target and tailor that intervention, we have to measure what's going on with that person. And unfortunately, we largely don't do that. We also have the problem of access. Australia is such an um, interesting country, remarkably urbanized. So we've got nearly 90% of the populace living in large metropolitan areas and roughly two thirds in um, capital cities. As a result of that, with problem solving courts, like naturally the resources are going to be concentrated in these areas, which means that clients in regional, rural, and remote areas are disadvantaged, that they may not be able to access the court at all, or if they do, they may not be able to participate in the um, uh, treatment and service provisions that would be afforded to people in these metropolitan areas. Even in metro areas, though, we also see with problem solving courts, sometimes uh, we fail to supply the demand. So now we've got this like large cohort of offenders that used to go to prison or used to be sentenced to a probation order that we're now leveraging into, say, drug and alcohol treatment. It's this influx of, of um, people in need of treatment that the available resources in the area might not actually be able to rise up and meet each one of those person's um, treatment needs. This may also have an unfortunate flow on consequence in that it then limits the availability of services for people that are non-forensic clients, people from the general community that are trying to tap into these services that can't because they're being expended on this um, sort of specialty docket. We've also got the problem of substance, and I know that sounds crude, but hear me out for a second. Uh, when we talk about um, problem solving courts and say that they're rehabilitation oriented, it's important to point out that not every activity that we engage in under the banner of treatment is really of quality in regard to the rehabilitative ideal. So many treatments that we deliver um, under the guise of problem solving courts are not actually evidence-based. They violate a like canon of empirical evidence about the effective ways for us to um, uh, intervene with correctional populations. So we see that violation of the risk principle. We're not really assessing who this court might be most appropriate for in some instances. Uh, we see a violation of the need principle. Are we actually targeting the person's reasons for offending or are we making some assumptions about why they commit crime and trying to treat those things? We see a violation of the responsivity principle. We kind of treat everybody that comes before the court the same, not maybe recognizing that people have learning differences, cultural differences, personality differences, that you would want to tailor your communication style. In addition to that, the responsivity principle says that for treatment to be effective, you really want to use cognitive behavioral techniques of intervention. And unfortunately, a number of the treatments that are provided under problem solving courts fail to meet that kind of standard, that threshold of quality. We also want to be mindful that, you know, sometimes uh, you'll have advocates of problem solving courts go, oh, but we see these positive effects, like, so obviously treatment is working. A couple of caveats that you might want to keep in mind to, to play devil's advocate here. It might be that you're looking at intermediate outcomes. So again, clients might go, this is great. I feel like I'm, you know, addressing my problems and, and I feel really good about it might not lead to a reduction in reoffending. We also see that sometimes um, studies are biased in that uh, the participants of these courts already had pre-existing risk levels that were quite low, so they were probably unlikely to commit a reoffense to begin with. Um, and then we also have studies that um, are really quite poor in research design. They suffer from something called a self-selection bias. When people opt into this court, it may be that they're you know, more motivated to change, more likely to be compliant with the court orders. And so as a result, if you see reduced um, reoffending, um, say compared to a, a control sample of business as usual, it could be because these people were already wanting to do quite well. 
Uh, we've also got the problem of constitutionality. And I kind of put this in scare quotes because I understand that, you know, I use the word constitution and people are like, oh, this American girl, she doesn't understand, you know, the legal landscape here. Um, and what I would say is that you're right, I'm not a legal scholar. However, I use this phrase quite intentionally. So in the United States, our constitution includes the Bill of Rights, and that Bill of Rights affords uh, court defendants with a number of legal protections that um, we hold quite dear. Um, in Australia, you do have a constitution, but it means something a little bit different here. Um, in some ways, you might argue that the lack of blanket legal rights uh, fails to then deliver a number of procedural safeguards for the people that are being processed through these specialty courts. That then, unfortunately, and I'll give some examples here, offenders might actually be harmed by participating in problem solving courts, if opposed to, you know, some traditional legal processes. Uh, this largely revolves around three main criticisms. Let me break it down for you. So the first, we have the notion that the judge in um, problem solving courts is no longer an impartial adjudicator. The Australian Guide to Judicial Conduct, for instance, states that judges must avoid stepping into the arena or appearing to take sides. But problem solving courts, that is exactly what is meant to happen. The magistrate or the judge really inserts themselves in the process and forms an important part of the um, collaborative case management. They are part of the conversation and they use what's called their charismatic authority to help leverage that offender into treatment, to help, you know, congratulate successes as they're earned, to um, really try and reshape behavior when some, you know, misconduct occurs. So they're really inserting themselves in the process and some critics of uh, problem solving courts go deep problematic. We need to avoid that. We also see that with problem-solving courts, they are now medicating rather than adjudicating. So we have the question of, uh, are people really being coerced into treatment? Do defendants have rights when the alternative is imprisonment? So we really need to question the voluntariness of some of these courts. If people are basically given the option of, you know, oh, you can participate in this process or you can go to prison, your choice questionable then if the person has rights and if those rights are clearly explained to them in a way that they're able to digest um, and then make an informed consent decision. Uh, we also see an imbalance between um, the treatment that we're trying to provide and due process. So for example, um, and I think for me, this is the biggest problem of problem solving courts uh, outside of that definitional issue, is what happens when offenders fail. So let's say you've got um, a defendant that appears before a specialty court and they have monthly check-ins for six months. Things are going well initially, but then they start to go off the rails a bit. Maybe it's a drug and alcohol court and they've got a dirty urine test. And so after the you know sort of six month process, we go, you know, Mr. Smith, unfortunately this is not working. So I'm going to you know suspend your participation in the program and sentence you now to six months of imprisonment. Well, if the original sentence was going to be six months of imprisonment, you might argue that this individual has now been doubly punished. And so we want to think quite carefully about how we respond to defendants when misconduct occurs, when they breach the, the orders of the court, how do we respond in a way that they are afforded due process rights? So given these types of um, problems, I think we've, we've solved a number of problems of traditional legal processes, um, which is fantastic, but we've also got some new problems that have emerged. Um, I think that these are not insurmountable, but we do require you know, some really thoughtful consideration about how to respond. Um, and that's for two reasons. If these courts are going to be retained and then propagated, so if we want to see the spread of them and utilized um, in, in more spaces with no, more cohorts, we want to make sure that um, we're attending to some of these challenges. We also need to do this in order to maximize effectiveness. We don't want these courts to just make people feel good. I do think that's important. But ultimately, we want to reduce reoffending, which is important for the life trajectories and personal outcomes for the um, uh, defendants that are involved. But it's also important as a matter of public safety. We want these courts to be effective to you know, really serve a crime prevention kind of function. So how do we solve the problems that I just talked about? I've got five um, proposed solutions, if you will. 
So the first is that we need to improve access. So we want to think about technology facilitated justice in a you know quote unquote post COVID world. This is wholly possible now. We've really seen how um, video conferencing, for instance, can be used. Um, telemedicine is quite popular. App based um, rehabilitation programs are now being delivered. So we can think about um, you know trying to extend access to these sports to people in areas outside of you know Australia. And metro, and we can now do this with technology on our side. We also, though, want to think about when we do engage in problem solving courts outside of metropolitan areas, we want to be very, very careful about how we respond to breaches when people are unable to lack the uh, access of, to um, programs and services in that area simply because they're unavailable or they're full or whatever the case might be, or they you know, lack the, the programmatic features that are required by the court. We have to think really carefully about whether we are punishing individuals for community context kinds of issues that they really can't do anything about. We want to improve assessments. This is perhaps an unsurprising um, uh, proposition given what I discussed earlier. So for problem solving courts to be effective, let's think about this quite logically. We wanna target individuals with particular problems. We wanna understand the nature of that problem. And we wanna implement solutions that target that nature that we believe are leading to their offending. If we want to do that, I'm going to be quite blunt here. We need problem solving courts to routinely and reliably utilize actuarial validated risk assessment instruments, risk and need address assessment instruments. If we want to know why this person commits crime, what we need to do about it, we can only do that with tools that are designed to provide us with that kind of information. This idea that, you know, oh, well, I've got expertise because I, I've been working in, in justice for 20 years. I see offenders day in and day out. I know what their problems are. I would say that that's a bit um, naive and in some ways offensive. We really want to rely on um, better diagnostics. If you went to your GP and said, oh, you know, I've got this tummy bug, I've been vomiting and whatever, and your doctor says, let's try vitamin D, it might be a, you know, vitamin deficiency, you would think he was a quack, you would be asking for second opinions, because he didn't perform any kind of additional, you know, examinations, he just made this kind of guess and said, let's go with it. The same thing goes in the criminal justice system. If we are making educated guesses about how to treat people, it's wrong. We need validated assessments to tell us what to target, and then we need to do so. We also need to improve services. And I apologize if this comes across as um, offensive to any um, service providers that might be present today or might be reviewing the recording afterward. I really do mean no offense. Happy to talk this through further. Let me hopefully explain my position and um, hopefully you'll see what I mean. Now, what we mean here, if problem solving courts are going to pull the legal lever of treatment, if we're going to say, you know, you've got the threat of incarceration or you can participate in this treatment program, those are your choices. If we are going to do that, and that is a quite serious proposition, we need to make sure that when we put them into treatment, it is quality treatment. A failure to do so is a, really a failure of problem solving courts altogether. If they're rehabilitation oriented, if we're trying to solve the problems of people, the underlying causes of why they offend, and you send them to a, um, a, a treatment that doesn't actually treat, that's not actually rehabilitative, we are really doing a disservice to the clientele that present to these specialty courts. So we wanna make sure that the treatment that's delivered is evidence-based, it adheres to those principles of effective correctional intervention, the empirical evidence now is overwhelming about what we need to do in that space. We want to make sure that treatment is holistic. This requires true interagency cooperation, particularly for offenders with complex needs, constellation of things that are happening. We need to make sure then that we are delivering on each element of treatment for each one of those criminogenic needs. We also want to make sure, and I know this is um, hard to hear sometimes, but we want to make sure that we're not prioritizing social service provisions against things that are actually rehabilitative, that are actually under the banner of correctional intervention. So we've got evidence, for instance, that, you know, providing offenders with employment, putting them in touch with accommodation services, 
These types of things are important. They are but they are not rehabilitation. They are not correctional treatment. I can go into that later if required, but the important component here is that when we leverage people into treatment, we actually need to be treating their criminogenic needs. We also wanna make sure that when problem solving courts are evaluated as being better than business as usual, that we don't then um, sort of make the um, kind of erroneous assumption that it is because treatment is working. It might actually be because the traditional legal process was harmful, it was criminogenic, it was making things worse. Maybe the problem solving court, as we talked about this element of procedural justice, these types of things might help to improve outcomes comparatively that doesn't mean the treatment is working. So we wanna think really critically about evaluating, or my apologies, assessing uh, what types of treatment that people need and then evaluating whether or not the treatment that's being delivered under the guise of problem solving courts that we're actually um, delivering on the things that we've assessed. We also want to improve some of the processes involved. So uh, realistically, um, for problem solving courts to um, sort of have a mainstay in Australia and to, I think, help legitimize um, their sort of perception among other people, we really want to um, uh, develop some supportive legislation that helps to redefine scope, aims, and procedures. Uh, yes, flexibility is required, right? Because when defendants come before the court and we're trying to solve their problems, address the underlying cause of crime for that particular individual, you want to tailor your response in line with the responsivity principle a thousand percent. However, it cannot be at the cost of, you know, not using standardized practices because this can be really dangerous. If we go, ah, oh, let's be flexible. Let's just do whatever it takes we run the risk of replacing that initial cautious tone that was the hallmark of, of uh, the introduction of problem solving courts in Australia. We replace that cautious tone with a capricious one where we just go, you know, let's just wing it and see what happens. That can be quite problematic. Uh, unfortunately, what can happen is that uh, courts under the guise of therapeutic jurisprudence unfortunately can produce harms. So for instance, around the voluntariness of participation. We can't be coercing people into treatment in ways that um, violate some of their inherent rights. We also need to be careful about how we punish people for um, failures that they may present with, with uh, in the court. So coming up with some improved processes, um, including some legislation that guides some of these procedural safeguards is an important next step. And then finally, look, I'm a researcher, so I'm gonna talk about research. We need more research in this space. So problem solving courts, unfortunately, are too often declared as successful without persuasive proof, and then they get expanded based on what is largely anecdotal evidence. If we are going to continue to sort of experiment with justice innovation, which I invite, that's a, that's a great idea. If something isn't working, dude, let's try something else. Absolutely fantastic. If we're going to do that, though, we need to evaluate what we're doing, figure out which bits work, which bits don't, and improve things incrementally as we go. In order to do that, we need more evidence. Uh, we do have outcome evaluations. However, they're lacking. If you look at systematic reviews of problem-solving courts in Australia, the <laughs> overwhelming tone of those pieces is that they couldn't find enough studies that met the inclusion criteria to be uh, you know, uh, summarized in these reports. We don't have enough evaluations that use rigorous social science methodologies. So for instance, we're missing some quasi experiments where we really look at uh, problem solving court participants compared to um, uh, traditional court participants, uh, looking at pre and post participation in these programs and including random assignment, for instance where people are, um, uh, yes, given the option, they must consent. However, once they consent, we randomly assign them to this condition versus that condition, uh, controlling for things like risk levels, criminogenic needs, then evaluate what happens. That will give us much, much, much stronger evidence about what's happening here. We also have this issue of what's called gray literature and um, the file drawer problem. So because a number of evaluations are um, government commissioned, 
sometimes what happens is um, uh, we take these reports and we produce them for internal purposes within a particular government agency, and we don't release them um, for you know other researchers to be able to see, for the public to be able to consume. And so we want to think carefully about how we um, sort of distribute the evidence in ways that other people are going to be able to learn from. I would beseech you, if you are listening to this presentation and you say, I'm part of a problem solving core in, in my local area, and I think what we are doing rocks. I think we've actually addressed every single problem that you've brought up today. I think we're doing it quite well. Then please, please invite a researcher in to evaluate it so that we can start to accrue the evidence of, of what's working in this space. All right, to summarize my presentation here, um, what I would say is that over the last, say, 20 years, 25 years, um, since uh, problem solving courts have been first introduced to the Australian landscape, uh, we really are at a fork in the road with what these courts look like. Um, while the courts have originally selectively borrowed from uh, their American counterparts, that gap is starting to close. So originally, some of these courts, you know, that initial cautious tone, making sure that the judge does, doesn't overstep their bounds and does remain sort of the adjudicator in what is traditionally an adversarial process, trying to remain sort of impartial and neutral and, and providing judgments accordingly, um, we're seeing that that gap is closing. The types of features that we're seeing in contemporary problem-solving courts um, raise an eyebrow about the reasons why we're doing this and whether they are, um, uh, you know, respectful of defendants' rights, whether they are evidence-based and effective. So we want to make sure that we're we're thinking really thoughtfully about these things rather than just going, oh, it looks like a good idea. We've got some anecdotal evidence over here. Let's expand it. Uh, Problem-solving courts cannot be everything to everyone. Uh, when you do that, you really do run the risk of being nothing to no one. A problem-solving court cannot do everything and be everything. We cannot address every need. So we really want to think about the guiding principles that led to the development of problem-solving courts. Therapeutic jurisprudence, that procedural satisfaction, we want to make sure that we are reducing the harms that the traditional legal process would sometimes provide, unfortunately. Problem solving courts need to include that as an inherent element, or I would argue they are no longer problem solving courts. We also want to make sure that we are actually addressing the underlying cause of offending, simply diverting people away from the court to you know, reduce overflow in, in the custodial centers, that is not a problem solving court. Um, uh, having a, a docket where the courtroom actors are uh, mindful of the specialist population that they're meeting with and simply then delivering, um, say, sentencing remarks that are, are sensitive to uh, this particular um, special population of, of forensic clients, that is not a problem solving court. If it is not, addressing the reasons why people commit crime, and if it's not doing so with validated risk and need assessment instruments, so we know what those things are, evidence-based treatments that are actually rehabilitation focused, if we're not relying on that uh, sort of case management, case collaboration approach, if we're not coordinating services, it's not a problem solving court. I'm sorry, it might be really lovely and, and doing good things, but we need to think carefully around the definitions here. So in conclusion, uh, the last point that I would really want people to take home um, as the sort of um, most important message here, if we want problem solving courts in Australia to be effective, and I would argue we do, we have sufficient evidence that we want to have these continue, but we wanna think really thoughtfully about how to do that most effectively. We want to make sure that the solutions that we're um, sort of proffering are actually tailored to the problems that are being presented in these courts. If we don't do that, then it's just illogical. And I'm sorry to be crude about that. But if you don't target for intervention, the actual reasons why people are committing crime, logically, you cannot reduce reoffending. So we want to be really clear about that component. As a result of that, 
we have to clearly define the problem. Uh, contemporarily, Australian problem solving courts really do suffer from this kind of ideological crisis. There are really, really blurred boundaries around what constitutes a problem solving court, what does not, who we're going to target, how we're going to target, all of these types of things vary substantially. If we have some uh, clearer, more delineated lines around what we're trying to accomplish here, I think ultimately we're going to see that problem solving courts are able to meet the spirit that they um, sort of intend and hopefully then um, prove to be effective um, and then you know, resulting in both um, participant and community satisfaction. Uh, I've included some references, but as um, Nigel said, I'll also make some um, links to some of the things that I've talked about today, make some links to um, some really kind of um, like cornerstone pieces in this space, make those available um, after this presentation. Um, and at this stage, I will close out for questions. Thank you so much. So um, many thanks for that, Lacey. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I'll invite Hugh in as well. Um, and I guess we could start by with you. I mean, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Lacey. It's very, very fascinating. Um, it resonates a lot with how we think of a lot of issues on the right. civil justice side. Um, I can immediately see a number of, of similar, similar challenges, particularly in terms of um, uh, designing services or, or, or interventions, Absolutely. and um, particularly how we might uh, evaluate them in a way that's evidence-based, evidence sound, convincing, persuasive. Absolutely. Um, I'm particularly interested, though, if you could explain just a little bit more about how you see sort of what you referred to as holistic treatment yep. or the holistic approach. So for me, and probably Nigel, I'm particularly interested the extent to which um, that includes addressing people's civil and other legal needs or related right. needs that, that, that they might have. Because um, I think personally, we probably believe that sort of one of the weaknesses of the criminological literature yep. is that it doesn't adequately deal with um, somebody's civil legal needs as a factor that might contribute to their offending in the first yep. place. Yep. So we can immediately see a situation, say, where somebody um, might have you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars worth of debt. Yes. It might well be that having some sort of intervention to address the legality of that debt, maybe it's not fully legal, and there's ways to sort of write it off or, or deal with it, okay. um, or other sort of more prudent financial steps. Absolutely. So I think um, uh, Nigel actually touched on it at the very beginning when he introduced the um, sort of topic of the presentation today and talking about people's life needs, about when someone presents before a problem solving court, we're not just looking at um, their offense as being sort of an isolated incident. We're really looking at the broader kind of spectrum of what brought them here, what's going on for them and so on. If one of the um, sort of guiding principles of these courts is trying to reduce the harms of the criminal justice system, that also includes including quite clear explanations to participants, for instance, about what this process is going to include. That might then also say uh, retroactively look at some of the harms that have been perpetrated and try to address those in a way that um, the individual is able to address them, maybe with the assistance of some service providers. Uh, the book chapter that I've referenced um, with Mrs. Uh, Caitlin Egan uh, discusses this a little bit around making sure that the language that we use is quite clear and easily digestible for people. Um, but I think there's a number of, when we talk about holistic treatment, part of that includes, okay, so it's a drug and alcohol court, we're going to send them to substance abuse treatment, that's a kind of no-brainer but maybe they're using substances because of a mental health condition. So we're also going to provide some mental health intervention. Maybe um, uh, they have a physical health condition. So we're also going to make sure that we leverage treatment into that area as well. I would say included with all of these types of things is really thinking about that individual as a whole, which includes some of those civil and legal things. Uh, I think there's, there's probably some creative things that could be done in that space. 
but it requires, I think, um, yeah, that really kind of um, coordinated approach of the courtroom work group coming together in a way that would enable that type of thing that you're referring to. I absolutely think it's possible. Uh, given that my um, uh, sort of primary area of expertise is offender rehabilitation, I am a huge advocate of what we call cognitive skills training, providing people with very um, sort of basic, um, they're, they're sometimes referred to as life skills around things like consequential thinking, um, uh, perspective taking, different types of things in that space. When we do that, we can actually see a number of flow on effects then as well, including the way that they approach these kinds of problems, rather than brushing it off, having an ability to say, you know what, you're right, I don't want that, that's uncomfortable, that's one of the reasons that I've evaded the court three times before, I don't want to do that anymore, if you're offering a way out of that, I'm happy to take that on board now, so having that more therapeutic whole of person approach. I think there's many things we can do in that space to address a number of these kinds of complex needs that people are presenting with. Just building on that, I can see a question here, which um, asks specifically, what would you say is a good example of holistic and true interagency cooperation? Uh, they referenced the Neighbourhood Justice Centre, which is a short walk from me here. Yep. Um, they say the Neighbourhood Justice Centre in Melbourne has shared case management system and operates as one team, even though they come from a range of home agencies. And it's just asking um, whether there are other problem solving courts in Australia that might operate in this sort of way. Yeah, I actually think that's a really beautiful example. That's something that we would want to see. I think um, one of the problems in this space is that we offer um, sort of a, a case coordination approach where we bring together representatives from various agencies um, or, or social service providers, say, and we're trying to case management this individual. What happens sometimes is that the individual can then feel overwhelmed with all the different touch points that are required. They might have a singular case manager, but if they're being referred to multiple services, sometimes this can feel like a really uphill battle that they're trying to, to, trying to climb. Um, so I think um, uh, we've seen some evidence that sometimes when we do that, um, things can backfire. So I would say we, we want to think about um, trying to package interventions, if you will. So rather than going, all right, Mr. Smith, you've got, you know, 12 criminogenic needs that have been and social kind of concrete needs that have been identified in this assessment. So we're going to send you to 12 different agencies. Rather than doing that, if we are able to bring treatment and service provisions together in one place, mm -hmm. package them in a way that enables the person to take them on board in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming, I would say that that would be a win in this space. But it sounds largely like um, part of what they're doing is um, a, a beautiful coordinated approach toward that end. Just moving on to the... Um research and evaluation piece which is clearly close to my heart there's a question from roxy here which is asking for whether there's any specific resources when it comes to um, either gray primary or secondary when it comes to best practice interventions best practice process or outcome evaluations um, noting the limitations um, that you point to which is pretty much exactly the question i wrote down you know can you direct us to any you mentioned the need for better evaluation sure um, for maybe experiments, maybe quasi-experiments if we can't get that far. Uh, what have you seen that's been really good? Yep. For me, um, there is a report uh, that sort of summarizes the available evidence um, out of um, the United Kingdom that I'm happy to share in the mm -hmm. list of references that I provide. I think they do a really phenomenal job of reviewing the evidence and saying, based on the limitations, but based on what we do uh, sort of have some degree of confidence over what we're seeing here, here are the recommendations for how people sh should proceed. Here are some best practices that we see um, as being really important that you would want to incorporate if you're going to use a problem solving court approach, if you're going to use collaborative case management, here are a couple of um, loosely defined best practice principles for how to proceed. That for me is probably the um, uh, most influential piece at the moment. There are some efforts to replicate that type of thing here in the Australian context. And unfortunately for me, it just 
it it wouldn't fit the bill of what they're describing. I think um, you know some of the the efforts to do systematic reviews of problem solving courts here in Australia they they include you know six studies and that is almost like you know that's not systematic then that's a little bit of cherry picking of what's actually been produced and made uh, available for public consumption with um, this notion of gray literature, the file drawer problem, you do need a much larger approach where you are contacting agencies and asking for reports that they need to be willing to share. That's the other component, and I'm sorry to say that. I would say that the, the report from the UK that um, I'll provide a link to, they do a great job of pulling some of that stuff in. Here in Australia, I would say there is sometimes a reluctance that if a um, particular government, if a local area has implemented a problem solving court and maybe let's say it, it backfired, unfortunately rates of reoffending increased, um, the, the court collapsed for all of these kinds of procedural uh, dramas that, that popped up as they sometimes do, they then hold that um, evaluation quite privately and, and are um, understandably apprehensive to share that, which, which I, I can appreciate. But in doing that, I think it can be then quite challenging for us to draw conclusions around what's working. If people are only publishing studies that are effective, how are we supposed to learn what's ineffective? We really do need an array of evidence in Australia, I don't see any pieces available as of yet that really do that quite well. So the UK piece for me is where if you're looking for best practices, uh, sort of discern from the available evidence base, that's where I would be looking. I think that's a great point. Um, I think, you know, the, the products of research need to be published is, is the take home message. And, you know, you can celebrate a lot in the null finding. Um, there's a, there's a sure. famous there's a famous piece in sort of Hugh and I's area by a guy called Jim Greiner who looked at the impact of representation provided by Harvard Legal Aid Bureau and found very little in his first study. That's a learning opportunity. You know, yeah. if that was buried, then you just get publication bias. Correct. Um, just pivoting slightly, if I can find it. There was, there, was, there, was, there was a question here that just appealed to me. It's kind, it's kind of a Judith Resnick, probably the best person to answer it. But... Grant Roberts says, notwithstanding the advent of online courts, the participation of magistrates and judges in problem-solving courts continues to occur in a courtroom. What are your thoughts about the influences of the physical structure and organization of the participants and the fit out of the courtroom? It's a court architecture question. Absolutely. I actually love this question. So um, uh, I had the opportunity um, to travel around Queensland and look at a number of different courts um, and how they um, in particular were um, uh, relevant to probation and parole. But in doing that, we sat in a number of com uh, community courts and um, uh, sort of Indigenous justice, sort of sentencing circles, um, those types of courts. Those obviously do, um, some of their central elements include a quite different layout. So for instance, the magistrate isn't elevated up above everyone else, literally looking down. We're all on the same level. We're sitting around in a circle and we're having some really important conversations. I think in principle, it is a beautiful symbol of what we're trying to accomplish with these courts. So in principle, I think it's absolutely fantastic. The only sort of um, uh, reason for pause for me to be more a little bit more carefully considerate is that when we do that, we run the risk of uh, sort of um, the the definitions of people's roles being blurred a little bit. That if we're having a collaborative case management conversation and we're all on the same level in a circle, that this can turn into more of a chat um, where indeed the, the judge or the magistrate is then losing their role in this process. Um, you've got people that are, um, I think, sometimes um, uh, overstepping some professional boundaries, uh, for instance, providing commentary on things that maybe um, is outside their area of expertise. And when you're sitting in a circle having this kind of chat, these types of things, I think, are sometimes natural. So I would say, in principle, beautiful, let's keep it up. But again, I would say if we can think more critically about what is it that these courts are trying to accomplish and how are we going to do that, if you can stick to those principles, the infrastructure thing or the, the courtroom layout, if you will, I think is a, an excellent way to go. Um, focus on thera uh, therapeutic jurisprudence, 
focus on reducing the harms, focusing on procedural justice and helping participants to feel heard, seen, uh, respected, all of those things, we can probably accomplish that a lot better if we don't have the judge sitting up above uh, the sort of adversarial sides on each side of the table, um, uh, sort of almost feeling like the defendant is being attacked. Sitting in a circle, all on the same level, it sounds great, as long as we can do it in a way that, um, uh, yeah, doesn't violate the, the role of each party in the process. So uh, like one of the arguments for some of those core architecture studies is around participation. Yep. And as you were talking through um, some of the advantages of problem solving courts, it just struck me that I know it's very different in the tribunal scenario, but there's been a lot of work on you know active effective participation in processes and i was wondering what if anything had been done in the problem solving court domain about whether people can participate more actively more effectively and what advantage if any that might have yeah i think um for me probably the most um uh, persuasive point of evidence in regard to that is maybe the um domestic and family violence in Southport um, here in Queensland. The um, uh, information that we have from some of their evaluations around how some of the participants feel, I think is um, very much in support of what it is that you're suggesting there, Nigel. So mm -hmm. um, this is something that I think um, probably should be pursued. For me, it, um, it, yes, it's a symbol um, around procedural fairness, around um, people feeling um, supported and heard. That includes, um, for instance, in the DFV court, that includes perpetrators and victims, which is always, you know, it's almost somewhat um, surprising, but people feel supported throughout that process, which is fantastic. I would say um, one of the ways that we might be able to improve that, though, is by providing really clear explanation around the participants' rights and how they might wish to participate in the process. I think if um, uh, we're, we're seeing in the, the literature a term called legal socialization, that uh, people have been trained or primed to participate in the criminal justice system in a particular way. If you have someone that has a quite extensive history with the criminal justice system and they are used to a particular process, when you now introduce something new in the problem solving court arena, it can be a little bit complicated, I think. So let's say you have someone who is part of a, um, a drug and alcohol court and they come into the court for their monthly check in and they're actually struggling really, really a great deal with temptations. They've relapsed a couple of times. They're now sitting in a situation of going, do I divulge this? so that I can get the assistance that I require? Or do I keep it secret out of, you know, fear of um, sort of retribution that, that there's going to be some ill consequence if I let people know? So having real um, nice conversations, easily digestible about how people can participate, yeah. I think is the best way to go here. I see we might be getting to the end, but if I can just jump in and ask the sort of the what works, um, question sure um, one of the things I, I i i was hearing as you were talking is that we probably have a bit of a blurring between um problem solving courts or uh, lists or whatever it might be and some mainstream practices Thousands. that mainstream practice uh, courts have increasingly been taking on certain features of um, therapeutic justice and in fact, we would see good case management as perhaps having um, a number of these features. So if we've got a little bit of a blurring sure. um, between the nature of the interventions, I mean, one of the things from an evaluation point of view is you really always want to know the, the impact of the intervention compared to mainstream or, or standard practices. Um, so I'm wondering, um, I imagine there's a massive data challenge here. Um, some people won't be that surprised to see or to hear me then start talking around, well, can there be some sort of improvements to standard data collection across both types of, uh, or sorry, all types of courts that we could begin to draw some sort of insights um, around the nature of um, some different types of interventions because I would imagine that if we looked at it we would see standard courts achieving some of the same impacts sure. yep 
Yep, I think that's a really great point, um, Hugh. Thank you for that. I think um, indeed when it comes to uh, research and evaluation, it poses a number of challenges around inclusion criteria and how you compare these things if each court looks a little bit different and so on. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing in the, the literature around problem solving courts in Australia is that a number of courts, whether problem solving or adjacent, are over promising what it is that they're actually trying to accomplish. So I think for me, one of the take home messages would be that people that are working in this space want to be quite explicit about whether this is a problem solving court explicitly and it meets the fundamental features of a problem solving court, or if it is a mainstream court and we are trying to utilize some of the what works principles to, to hopefully improve practices in that space. This latter category cannot overpromise, cannot overstep its bounds and go, we're a problem solving court because of course we care about the people that come before the court and we're trying to make sure they don't come back, therefore we are. That's not necessarily the case. If it's not meeting all of these kinds of criteria, then I would say it's adjacent and not, you know, um, traditional problem solving court. So being quite clear about those things, I think, is going to be important. Now, in saying that, you um, sort of uh, had the question of effectiveness. This UK report that um, I'll provide, there's also, um, yeah, some systematic reviews that have been done in Australia that um, I'll, I'll happily link to. Uh, we do see, I think, the, um, the areas where problem-solving courts are most effective include um, when we utilize those really clear definitions. So for instance, drug and alcohol courts is where we have the most available evidence and where we see the most effectiveness. And I think that's because we are able to say very clearly, this is definitely a problem solving court. So we've got lots of evaluations to draw on. We've got lots of available evidence to go within the bounds of this kind of definitional consistency. Here's what we're seeing. And it is effective, which is great to hear, right? Nice. So if we want Want to be able to replicate that kind of process in other spaces, I think we need people to just be quite realistic about is this a problem solving court or not? If it is, we need to make sure that we are quite clear that it does include these features and here's how. If not, do not overpromise. Do not call yourself a problem solving court. Instead, you know, state this is a, a specialist adjudicating court, but it is mainstream, it includes some of those features, but it is not definitionally a problem solving court. If we can do that, I really do believe a number of the challenges that I've highlighted today are going to be resolved. Um, so just, you know, don't overpromise. We can't be everything to everyone you run the risk of being nothing to no one. We want to be really, really quite clear about what we're trying to accomplish with whom and how. If we do those things, I really do think we're going to be on the path to success. We've had a few questions coming in thick and fast, so I'll try and whiz through some. We no still drama. have a little bit of time it's left. This, the, Hugh or Lacey, either of you can do this, but could you just briefly further explain the concept of grey literature in this file draw problem? Yeah, for sure. Hugh, do you want to take that or you want me to go for it? Oh, no, you can roll with it. Oh, fantastic. All right. So, <laughs> most, of, um, most of my evaluations are grey literature, so... Oh, there we go. Oh, there, <laughs> there we go, yeah. Good <laughs> awesome. But you don't put them in the file drawer, though, Hugh, right? Oh, true. I, I was just about to say, sir, are you part of the problem? <laughs> so uh, what we really refer to here, um, so grey literature often refers to, for instance, government reports, for example, where they evaluate a particular practice, but because it doesn't get disseminated in traditional means, maybe it's not posted online, maybe it's not you know, published in an academic journal or in a book chapter in a way that a researcher such as myself would have access to, um, you know, it takes takes a lot of um, sometimes, I think, uh, personal relationship building to be able to contact the right person and access a report that hasn't been made publicly available. And there's a lot of challenges in that. Um, so that's, that's not necessarily the route we want to go. So gray literature often refers to, um, yes, these types of reports that aren't really made available for public consumption. The file drawer problem, on the other hand, refers to um, this publication bias that um, oftentimes what happens is you'll see researchers evaluate a particular program, practice, policy, and they say, ah, oh, fantastic, it works. I found really great um, sort of results here. I can't wait to publish this because it's yeah. a demonstration of you know, what works here. 
Unfortunately, what happens sometimes is uh, when we fail to um, sort of uh, refute the null hypothesis, so we, we do an evaluation of something and we see it doesn't work, we take that report and quietly put it in the file drawer so that no one knows about it. As Nigel stated earlier, we don't just want to make available information about what works. We also need to know about what doesn't work. So that file drawer problem of sticking away things that, um, you know, oh, it doesn't work, don't want anyone to know about it, it makes us look bad, whatever the case might be, we don't want to go down that road. We want to use the what doesn't work component as a learning opportunity. It provides uh, just invaluable information about how we can improve practices moving forward. So I would encourage people, if you've got evaluations in this space that show that things, you know, oh, we tried this and it didn't work, please let us know. Um, it's, it's really quite um, formative in, in providing um, information for future practices. Thank you. Um, this is just a brief one. Um, I might build on this question, but it says, great presentation from Demisson. Has the research examined the cost of problem solving courts? And my expansion would be cost benefit of problem solving courts. And were you convinced by that? Um, yes, I would say um, uh, really important. So we've got, um, for instance, cost benefit analyses that generally demonstrate that um, for each, each dollar that's expended on treatment orientations, $7 is saved on the back end because of the reduction in reoffending, because of the way we're now treating all of these kind of life circumstances that Nigel and Hugh had sort of discussed earlier. We're ultimately reducing the cost to the system by trying to intervene. Now, we're not always going to be successful, of course, but compared to business as usual, we are absolutely saving money. I think part of the challenge here is communicating this to the public in a way that is persuasive. So unfortunately, um, in Australia, and I would say it varies by state and territory, we have something called penal populism, which is where um, sort of uh, sentencing and punishment practices are representative of community sentiment about what we should be doing in these spaces. Mm -hmm. We can, I believe, convince Australian communities that problem solving courts are a wonderful move. We're moving in the right direction, that it's not, you know, quote unquote, soft on crime. And for me, one of the ways that I've always been able to, I think, um, uh, convince people that rehabilitation orientations are worthwhile pursuing is that we are going to save money. So if you are an Australian taxpayer and you're thinking to yourself, this criminal justice system is just outrageous, nothing works anymore, we've got this youth crime wave, we've got African gangs, these types of conversations that are happening in the general public. Uh, Kim Kardashian herself is talking about prison reform. People in general are starting to, you know, defund the police, are growing increasingly dissatisfied with what we are currently doing in the criminal justice system. If we can then provide evidence that this type of approach uh, uh, leads to better outcomes, improves participant satisfaction, and is cost effective, I think that that can be the lever by which we convince government departments, for instance, that we should be pursuing these things. The way we advertise these courts to the public is going to matter. We don't want to uh, demonstrate this <laughs> soft on crime approach. We want to, um, I think, uh, market this as being targeted, tailored, really responding to the issue rather than this kind of generic approach. This is a way that we can um, do that if we can demonstrate, yep, cost effective. And in general, I think the evidence suggests that very much it is. I have an interesting question here from Matthew Willis that I quite like, who says, do you see the principles and approaches adopted by problem solving courts influencing judicial practice in other mainstream or non problem solving courts? And if so, do you see that as a positive? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, I and it is a very interesting question. Um, I would say yes. Um, I think that um, as we've started to 
I think, accrue some evidence that problem solving courts are effective in particular spaces and in particular ways. I think it's natural that courtroom actors are going to, in other courts, are going to say, you know what, that's actually kind of cool. I really appreciate the way that, you know, the, the uh, court next door has been doing this. I'm going to adopt some of these practices as well. I think that is um, natural and to a degree should be encouraged. Um, I, I think in general, uh, you know, this notion that the process is the punishment and we don't want it to be. If we can see that in general, Australian courts are starting to adopt more therapeutic jurisprudence approaches in whatever form that might take, I would say that's a move in the right direction, should be encouraged. So I'm bouncing around a little bit here. Sure. Um, this is kind of, it, it, it goes to kind of one of my questions about how you select people for problem solving courts. My interest in there, of course, is like, you know, the impact that has on how we think about measuring impact and Correct. evaluation. Correct. There's one here from Ruth and it says, do you think the Curry Court in MCV could be expanded to be more than just available for guilty pleas? They realize this is a funding issue. Okay. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> can, um, can you clarify for me? So the Curry Court is an Indigenous Justice Court? Yes. Is that right? Yep. And what is MCV exactly? Oh, yeah. Magistrate. Magistrate Court of Victoria. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I realize we're hitting you with some Victorian specific yeah, I know, items. I know, I know, I <laughs> know. No, that's okay. I'm happy to be educated. Um, just need to know what we're talking about to make yep. sure it's like comment um, sort of effectively. So you're saying that that court at the moment requires a guilty plea, is that right? Yes. And whether it can be expanded? Wow. Yeah, reasonably, um, I think so. I think um, when I, and I know that I have an American lens um, that I'm, I'm using to look at this, um, but having been in Australia for 10 years now, when I see that these courts require a guilty plea for people to participate, it, I'm gobsmacked, <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I think um, if we are really um, operating on the premise that we want to help people, that we are trying to address the underlying causes of crime, and particularly in areas of Indigenous justice, I think we can do a lot more in this space to try and reach um, somewhat hard to reach populations, mm -hmm. um, populations that maybe don't have equitable access to particular things. Uh, the, the bottom line, and again, put quite bluntly, if we want to reduce indigenous overrepresentation in all aspects of the criminal justice system, we probably need to think more creatively about the way that we might bring people in to processes that are designed to be therapeutic, crime preventive, treatment oriented, and so on. Um, how you do that exactly, I think, um, might vary according to kind of local conditions, um, what the government, your sort of local legislation might allow. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, thinking quite creatively about it might provide you with a couple of options. Um, in general, I would say um, uh, the, the element of a guilty plea um, sort of rubs me the wrong way. I think it's possible that we might extend participation to people who are happy to acknowledge that they have treatment needs that they'd like to see addressed um, and that they're willing to participate, for instance, by a suspended plea, by saying, I'm going to participate in this process. If I fail, then we go through the traditional legal process. That might be a way of um, trying to bring in hard to reach populations. We want to be mindful of not um, uh, sort of engaging in net widening. So it, it doesn't you know, mean that every Indigenous person that comes before the court, that we, we pull them into this kind of process. But if we um, uh, step outside of the guilty plea to pull other people in, I think we can accomplish some really good things. Mm. And perhaps something that could have a really good pilot program designed and then exactly. evaluate. Perfect. Look at that view. Like um, that would be amazing. Um, that's I think that's one of the things that we want to see. If you look at so toward the earlier question of like best practices, what works, you know, what can we adopt here and so on. When you look at kind of the um, summary pieces of the available evidence in Australia on problem solving courts, the area that is most lacking is in relation to Indigenous justice. We have so many important pieces in this space around advocacy, around the importance of trying to prevent um, you know, harmful government interventions, co-design with indigenous communities, the importance of advocacy and, and uh, cultural sensitivity, all of these things. But 
we don't really have any evaluations of indigenous sports themselves and that's mm -hmm. problematic there's lots of good reasons to pursue these courts but if we had a little bit better information about how they work why they work if they work and you know what works and what doesn't i think we would um be able to yes more strongly persuade people that these are courts that are worthwhile pursuing and that potentially we can expand to other areas i'm being told to wrap up um, and I think that's as good as place as any to do so. If I had to summarize this, I'd say the take home message is more research and evaluation, better research and evaluation and publish that stuff, maybe more funding for that stuff. But I would say Absolutely. that. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I think that's as good a place as any to wrap up. So many thanks, Lacey, for a wonderful, engaging presentation. Apologies if I didn't get off onto your questions. There was quite a few of them. But many thanks to audience members for coming and taking part and also to Hugh. Alex Partington, Leon Meyer, and Jackie Matthews for making this session happen. Um, we hope to see you all at the next one later in the year. We've got one more network session to go before our International Access to Justice Forum in California in October that I'm also trying to persuade Lacey she should go to. Uh, we hope that some of the audience might be able to make it to California, either virtually or in person. And I think that forum is going to be a unique opportunity to build on some of the things that we do in these um, forum sessions and share work with and learn from some pretty wonderful people around the world who've got a sort of shared interest in making justice more accessible, more equitable. There's more information on that on our VLF website. Please do get involved. Um, and that's about it. So many thanks again, Lacey, and thanks to everyone for coming and see